Um, so uh, my name is Emily Mayhew. I'm a postdoc here at Monell. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Jennifer Cox. Uh, Dr. Cox is a dear friend and a former lab mate of mine. Uh, and she also has one of the most unique uh, and impressive CVs that I have ever seen. Uh, so she received her bachelor's degree in English language and literature from the University of Michigan, uh, and actually initially embarked on a career in journalism. Uh, but writing about health, she developed an interest in nutrition uh, and returned to school to earn her RD from Loyola University. And then this in turn sparked her interest in food and cooking and she earned a degree in culinary arts from the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, and then an internship experience next sparked an interest in food science. Uh, and Jen enrolled in the graduate program in food science and human nutrition at the University of Illinois. Uh, at the U of I, she specialized in sensory science uh, and applying her culinary and nutrition knowledge uh, to the study of sodium reduction strategies. Uh, she earned her PhD in 2016. And Dr. Cox is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Foods and Nutrition at the University of Georgia. Um, and she's also the director of their culinary science and nutrition program. At the University of Georgia, Dr. Cox has partnered with community health organizations to study effective nutrition education strategies uh, and to develop well-liked and highly nutritious recipes. Um, it's also worth noting that Dr. Cox has been recognized for her excellence in teaching and mentorship. Uh, and as someone who has been mentored by Jen, I can attest to her skill and her generosity in these areas. Through her educational path, Dr. Cox has built expertise spanning dietetics, community health, culinary arts, food science, and sensory science. And she's uniquely able to integrate these perspectives in her research program. Uh, today, Dr. Cox will be sharing some of her research with us in a talk entitled Looking Beyond the Sensory Booth Setting, uh, Confessions of a Non-Traditional Sensory Scientist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cox. Emily, thank you so much for that wonderful and heartfelt <laughs> introduction. I'm so very grateful. And I'm so grateful to everyone who has taken the time to attend this presentation. I'm going to... Start. Okay, there I go. Okay. It is such an honor to be able to participate in the Monell ser seminar series. Um, I was really looking forward to physically coming and visiting the facilities. Um, but of course, current circumstances have led to these virtual seminar sessions, which actually brings together more people. It's, it's, it's actually a good thing. But I do look forward to visiting the facilities in the future. So I look forward to, to, to coming to Philadelphia to see those facilities. Um, today, my presentation highlights sensory evaluation outside of the traditional sensory booth setting. Um, and so in terms of flow for this presentation, I wanna touch on what is a non-traditional sensory scientist, um, as well as highlight some of the sensory studies I have been involved in, which have been conducted outside of the traditional booth setting. Um, and then I will share some of my confessions and lessons learned from these studies. So what in fact is a non-traditional sensory scientist? Um, why would someone call themselves a non-traditional sensory scientist? Is this something that I made up? Um, let, me, let me explain. Um, when I talk with colleagues and my peers and even with my students, because I, I teach the sensory evaluation course here at um, UGA um, in Athens. I tell my students, I'm a classically trained sensory scientist. And that's important to note. Uh, my training as a sensory scientist began actually a decade um, ago in 2010, um, when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the sensory lab of Dr. Sue Lee. And I sought to be placed in the sensory lab under Dr. Lee's advisement because I had a culinary and nutrition background. Prior to grad school, I worked as a registered dietitian, uh, worked as a writer, I also went to culinary school. And I saw how being trained as a sensory scientist would be such a wonderful complement to my background. And here in this slide, I have a picture of the sensory testing setting in my lab, um, something that many of us are familiar with and it's home 
to us sensory scientists. Um, there in that setting, we design and execute sensory testing. We design difference testing, discrimination testing, effective testing, descriptive analysis testing. Um, some of us create model food systems to test our products or to test already existing food products. And we oversee the logistics um, from the temperature of the sensory testing area to the lighting, to rinse protocols, to the utilization of sensory testing software. And this is what we do in academic settings. And this is what we do in sensory companies. And there in that setting, we're working with human subjects to capture data about a product or some kind of food model. And as we know, obtaining human subjects that reflect the particular demographic that you're trying to capture, it is not easy. Um, and there are even certain demographics that are more difficult or almost impossible to capture um, in the traditional setting. Um, certain populations that are hard to capture could include limited resource consumers. And here I have a photo um, of some sensory testing that was conducted outside of the booth setting, uh, which I'll discuss further in the upcoming slides. Um, certain populations like limited resource consumers may not have the financial means to come and participate in traditional sensory testing um, settings, or they may even have some kind of fear about testing in environments outside of their comfort zone. Um, some populations like adolescents or even individuals with chronic health conditions can also be difficult to assess in traditional sensory settings. But regardless, these groups, many of these groups who I worked with as a registered dietitian, they warn inclusion into sensory evaluation of products or recipes that could provide a health benefit. Um, and I'm gonna highlight some of the studies that I've been working on outside of the, um, of the traditional sensory setting. Um, and so though I say I, I am a classically trained sensory scientist, I also consider myself to be a non-traditional sensory scientist who conducts sensory evaluation in non-traditional settings. And during my time here at UGA, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be able to collaborate um, and establish collaborations in which sensory evaluation outside the traditional settings have been needed. So one study um, I'm gonna speak about has been through the expanded food and nutrition education program within the state of Georgia. And this is a federally, federally funded program um, for the overall goal of improving health behaviors um, among limited resource consumers. Um, and it teaches these consumers how to make healthy food choices um, for the overall goal of you know, reducing obesity and chronic disease prevention. Part of FNAP, that's the abbreviation, I'll start saying FNAP, it involves nutrition education classes throughout the state of Georgia. And those classes are called Food Talk. And these classes have a recipe demonstration component. And these recipes have been part of this nutrition education curriculum for over a decade. But there's never been any type of formal sensory evaluation to see if these recipes are well accepted among the groups that they're targeted towards. Okay, or if they're not well accepted, then what about the recipe that isn't well accepted? Um, and sometimes we as experts, we create these recipes and we give them to these groups and we say, this is good for you. You need to make this at home. This tastes good. This is gonna help you with your health. But it's gotta start from the, from the bottom up. It's gotta start with the, with the baseline, with the, with the grassroots and, and, and on the ground. And that's what attracted me to this, to this study. So we conducted this large scale sensory evaluation project over the state of Georgia to get some, some baseline information. And so here's a snapshot of the, the ballots for the Food Talk Nutrition Education Curriculum. Um, it consists of eight nutrition education classes and those classes focus on simple nutrition messages through activities um, and, and recipe demonstrations. And these classes are held throughout the state of Georgia. Each class, each session has two recipes as part of the class for a total of 16 recipes. And the recipe demonstrations are about 15 minutes. The recipes are generally simple. They're generally straightforward in terms of preparation. 
And so for this sensory study, we designed these color-coded ballots, as you can see, for each nutrition education class topic. That way, um, people couldn't get it confused. Um, generally, for each um, nutrition education session, there's 15 participants. And so roughly over a nine-month period, uh, we collected over 800 ballots. So this was a large scale study. And I just want to give a little snapshot into, into the ballot, a little peek. Um, with sensory evaluation, you know, not being a familiar practice among the participants, uh, we felt that effective testing would be the best way to, way to go. Um, and so we utilized a modified nine point hedonic scale. Um, these participants were asked about how much they liked the recipe um, as well as the appearance, the flavor, the texture of the recipe. Um, and we also gave these participants uh, some bottled water as part of their rinse protocol. Obviously, you know, with community settings, you can't have an extensive rinse protocol, but we at least had bottled water. We also wanted to collect some information regarding purchasing habits of the participants. Um, since the goal of the recipe demonstration is for participants to want to utilize these recipes as part of their meal planning at home. Um, so for here, um, this is part of the Curly Noodle Supreme recipe. This is from session one of the nutrition education session. We're asking how likely are you to purchase ground turkey? Because ground turkey is a major ingredient in the recipe, okay? Um, how likely are you to prepare ramen noodles without using a seasoning packet? Um, how likely are you to purchase canned carrots? And we also did, you know, um, gather up some, some demographics information as well. So like traditional sensory evaluation settings, a large part of any sensory evaluation study involves logistics. And I'm telling you, this is a nine month study. We collected 800 ballots. And so um, I wish it could have been me who could have conquered the entire state of Georgia but it was not me, but what we did, we had um, program assistants. FNEP has program assistants who deliver the nutrition education courses along with those recipe demonstrations. And the program assistants are very tied in to the community in which they give those recipe demonstrations. And so what we did, we created materials to train those program assistants on a sensory evaluation protocol, okay? And we did that in person, we also did some virtual training. So those program assistants were aware of the basics of sensory evaluation and the importance of consistency um, and how to you know, collect the ballots and, and, and gather the, the, the data. The program assistants are also supervised by FNEP supervisors and those supervisors oversee um, different cohorts of the program assistants. And so those FNEP supervisors were also provided with in-person and virtual training. So I did a, a lot of training. And those supervisors supervised the sensory evaluation sessions. Um, now I did go across the state of Georgia um, to um, you know, watch some of the sessions. I couldn't watch all of them. Um, and so I am more familiar with the state of Georgia having come from, from Illinois. Um, now, the important thing, especially with logistics for sensory evaluation, we wanted to make sure that recipe samples were served in a, you know, approved plates or cups, that they were served in consistent portions, um, that the program assistants used the exact quantities in the recipe. They didn't do any additions, no omissions, no substitutions. I said that about 150 times to them. Um, and they, that, that they prepared all those recipes during those food talk sessions because everything had to be consistent and nothing could be prepared ahead of time. Now, when we look at those mean acceptability scores, and remember there are a total of 16 recipes, but for today, I'm just looking at a couple of them with you. Um, we see from this baseline data that these results do provide justification for modif modification or replacement of some recipes. Um, we utilize a threshold of seven or higher for acceptability. Now out of these 16 recipes, the Curly Noodle Supreme was the least liked. And I have a picture of the Curly Noodle Supreme up, up in the corner. Um, and 
I don't like it either. I'm just going to be, be, be honest. Um, the fruit-based recipes were more well received. We noticed a, a, a trend. Um, some meat-based recipes like skillet spaghetti, um, breakfast burrito with the eggs were also well, well received. Now, when we look at purchasing and preparation intent of some of the recipe ingredients and how those align with some of the key recommendations for the 2015 and 2020 dietary guideline for Americans, uh, we see one of the major reasons why this curly noodle supreme recipe didn't fare that well is because the recipe utilizes ramen noodles without the seasoning packet. And from this data, participants don't want to use ramen noodles in a recipe without a seasoning packet. I'm a registered dietitian. I don't want to use ramen noodles without a seasoning packet. That's just not the point of ramen noodles. And so this recipe definitely needs to be modified or even eliminated as part of the, the recipe demonstrations for the food talk and nutrition education sessions. Um, if we look at something like the skillet spaghetti per se, though the acceptability ratings were high, participants are less likely to purchase soy crumbles for whatever reason, be it cost or maybe it's not accessible to them. Um, but we did see with the curly noodle supreme that participants are likely to purchase ground turkey. And so maybe ground turkey could be used with the skillet spaghetti. You know, maybe that's a modification that we could use to increase susceptibility. So when we started getting some of this beautiful baseline data from FNEP, um, we want to see how some newer recipes would be received in terms of nutrition edu education programming. And so I then worked on a collaboration with SNAP-Ed, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education. And that's another um, federally funded program that provides nutrition education programming for limited resource consumers um, and it's nationwide, but it's housed in the state of Georgia through UGA. And so we wanted to see about acceptability for prospective recipes um, that could be implemented potentially into nutrition education programming. And so for this study, we had seven newly developed recipes and they were targeted towards SNAP-Ed participants. And this was over a, a two month time interval, a little bit shorter than the, the, the FNEP study. Um, these recipes were developed by a, a chef um, who highlighted trending recipes um, and, and recipes that highlighted some of the, the culinary landscape of Georgia. Um, I always tell people I didn't make the recipes, I oversaw the, the sensory evaluation. Um, and some of these recipes, the point of most of these recipes, they should be cost effective, they should be easy to prepare. And so for this study, this is a snapshot of the ballots. The ballots were um, a little shorter than the FNEP study um, because usually for a, a setting for, for this type, we had anywhere from 30 to 50 participants. So we didn't need a, um, a, a packet. We needed kind of a one pager front and back for, for people to, to, to fill out. And unlike the FNEP study that was conducted through the entire state of Georgia, uh, this study was targeted towards participants in the uh, Metro Atlanta area, but we did collect a total of 539 ballots. Now, similar to the FNEP study, um, again, this ballot, this ballot was one page folded up in half um, because the sessions were having anywhere from 30 to 50 participants. The participants rated for overall liking as well as appearance, flavor, and texture. Um, and they were also asked about likelihood to prepare this recipe. We want to get that question in because again, we also want to look at, okay, we're, we're trying to give you this recipe to, to prepare at home, but are you really likely to prepare this recipe? Now, I just want to touch base on the logistics of the study. Um, for example, for banana pudding overnight oats, um, in order to conduct sensory evaluation, these recipes had to be assessed for consistency. So this is an example of the recipe that I was provided 
for sensory evaluation. And I, and I looked at it, I said, it's fine, but we're gonna have to make some adjustments. If you look at the recipe, it's kind of a recipe that you will see at any kind of recipe put, book or, or something you know, online. And so we did have to make some adjustments in terms that we couldn't have anything as being optional. All the ingredients had to be put in there. I don't know if you looked on, I'm gonna go back to that last slide. The, the original recipe called for vanilla almond milk. Um, again, we had to look at accessibility, you know, for SNAP Air participants. So we changed that to, um, to skim milk. We changed the, changed the Greek yogurt to non-fat plain yogurt to make it more accessible. Um, and so we want to standardize the recipe that way it could be made and it could be consistent. And so if you see here, this is an example of a, a sample size of the banana pudding overnight oats. Um, it had a, 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 a tablespoon of the oats, um, uh, about an inch of sliced banana and a half a teaspoon of, of crumbled graham crackers. So everyone received the same type of sample. Everything was consistent. And that goes the same for all of the newly developed recipes. That's how they looked and that's how they were presented. Now, when we look at mean acceptability scores, um, we see that with these newly developed recipes, um, the recipes that were meat-based, and I'm using meat in quotation marks because the vegetarian tacos were made with soy crumbles, but we see that generally the meat-based dishes um, scored higher than the fruit-based dishes, which is a little different from FNAP. You know, those recipes, the fruit-based dishes um, had high acceptability levels, but if you start looking into the nutrition content for those FNAP recipes for the fruit-based ones, um, they do have a higher amount of added sugars and that impacts overall liking because people like sweet. And so with these newly developed recipes, the fruit-based recipes, um, far less added sugars, okay? And, and, and participants, they took note for that. Um, and as you can see, the banana pudding overnight oats, which is kind of a trendy recipe, you know, overnight oats, um, it was not a hit um, and it did score the lowest among the, the, the recipes. We also asked about saltiness and sweetness acceptability, uh, depending on the recipe. And that's why some recipes ask for saltiness, some, people, some recipes ask for sweetness, uh, because as we all know, sodium and sugar reduction is always an area to, to explore. My dissertation research was on sodium reduction. Um, and especially with such a large number of both SNAP Ed and FNAP participants uh, being hypertensive or you know, having diabetes, being overweight or obese or obese. So we're, we're trying to also look at um, certain taste components. Um, again, the recipes that were meat-based fared well in terms of saltiness levels. And this banana pudding overnight oats, it just was not a hit. Um, and um, I do know the Snap Bed team, they're trying to make some modifications. Um, you know, I did make a suggestion, maybe, maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and, and get a, a, a brand new, brand new recipe. If people aren't likely to repair to, to prepare these recipes at home, and that's that's the intent, um, the point of the sensory evaluation is to provide that data to, to justify that this recipe doesn't have a place um, with nutrition education programming. So not only have I been conducting sensory evaluation in non-traditional settings for limited resource consumers, um, there's other populations and, and settings that warrant sensory evaluation um, that may be difficult to place in a traditional sensory setting. And so I've had the opportunity to work with a local school district in Georgia to explore acceptability of plant-based school lunch entrees, uh, which is, um, as, as we all know, a pretty hot topic. Um, now the, the National School Lunch Program um, serves millions of meals a day to, to students across the United States. Um, and they're dealing with you know, childhood obesity um, and school districts are looking at um, plant-based, you know, protein entrees 
um, as as a means to to improve certain health behaviors. Not that the meals purely served are not nutritious because they do meet nutri nutrition guidelines, um, but they are looking into plant-based school lunch entrees. Um, not only that, more so the acceptability. If they were to incorporate these meals into the, the school cafeteria, are the students going to eat them? Because then at that point, you're dealing with the, the financial impact of, of students not, not eating meals. So this is a very, very um, touchy, touchy subject. So prior to us doing this study, we wanted to do a preliminary study. And the preliminary study was which entrees are we going to choose for the full scale study to look at acceptability of plant-based meals. Um, we originally had four um, plant-based school entrees, um, but for the preliminary study, we narrowed it down to three um, because one of the entrees, as tasty as it was, it was um, a tortilla crunch cup. It just wasn't even gonna be feasible in terms of full service labor, okay? So we just X that out. That, was, that just became not an option, no matter how tasty it was. So we narrowed it down to presenting um, the preliminary study for, for three entrees. We have super, super sloppy sliders, and that's more so lentil-based. Um, a big component of this is the cost per serving, as well as reimbursable meal components, okay? Because the National School Lunch Program, as well as the National School Breakfast program that's federally funded. And so you have to make sure those reimbursable meal components um, are there when you're doing recipe development. What was exciting about this preliminary study is that we did create the recipes in my lab. We made the recipes. Um, so, so, you know, we took ownership of the recipes unlike Snap-in and FNAP where FNAP, the recipes were already existing. Snap-ed, the newly developed recipes were created by um, a, a local chef. Here we have cheesy mac and cheese. Um, this is very heavy in terms of white beans. So that was, that was very, very bean based. And then we had um, ultimate chili, chili fries, which had a sweet potato base. And then the chili um, had kidney beans, pencil beans. Again, we pretty low cost per per serving, and then we had our reimbursable uh, meal components. And so we did some preliminary testing on several classes of freshmen in that school district, and those freshmen were enrolled in the home economics program. And what's great about freshmen, they're very honest. They don't care if they hurt your feelings. Um, and so we saw that we had to go back to the lab and work more on the acceptability of these recipes. With the sweet potato and chili fries, the, the, the chili was just too chunky. They, they couldn't handle the chunkiness. And it, it, it's so good to get data from the, the, the real life consumer because me, I love chunky chili, but they were like, no, we, we hate it. Okay, so we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board. The sloppy joes, they said the lentils weren't blended enough. Um, the, the fact that they saw pieces of lentil, which I thought was attractive, um, they thought, that, that didn't work. They don't want to see the lentils. They want it well blended so it can look like a, a, a fake, fake sloppy joe. The macaroni and cheese that was heavy in beans, it actually tasted good. And, and, and if you look, um, it scored the highest in terms of appearance, uh, but we found out it wouldn't be a good item for hot holding on the line because the texture would change in about a minute from serving. It got so grainy within one to two minutes that if you literally did not consume it uh, within one to two minutes, you could taste the, the graininess that, that came from those, those beans. So based on that preliminary testing, that's why you do preliminary testing, we said we're gonna go with the sweet potato chili fries and the sloppy joes, but we still had to go back to the drawing board, had to go back into the product development lab to revamp those recipes, but that allowed us to choose those two recipes for a full scale study, okay? And so with the full scale study, and we 
just finished that study right before the pandemic hit. And I'm so grateful that we finished it and I have that data. Um, and so we're, um, I don't know if you're looking at the lower corner, I have some manuscripts that are, are pending that I'm, I'm super, super happy about. So this full scale study was done um, at two middle schools um, in the Jackson County School District in the state of Georgia. Um, to, you're talking about a total of about 1200 stu students. Um, and what we would do, repair a regular entree with a plant-based entree. Um, and we did it twice. Um, and then we have a washout period. And then we did the, the other plant-based entree and my um, PhD student, Allie Linky, um, who oversaw the study, um, saw, uh, provide a significant amount of, of training to the food service staff. And again, when we talk about logistics and sensory testing, um, a huge part of the study was the training to the food service staff, because if they couldn't make the recipe so it would be consistent, then you don't have good data. And so my PhD student and I, I went a couple of times, had extensive training with the food service staff in terms of how to make these recipes. Now these recipes weren't hard to make, but you have to make sure it's consistent and you have to make sure it's consistent in terms of serving to the students, okay? So quite a bit of logistics was involved um, with, with this study, which um, I mean, this picture is cute, but it just doesn't show the amount of logistics that that went went into this into this study. My time is 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 is, is, is winding down a bit, but I, I just want to also highlight a couple of more studies um, that I've been working on involving non-traditional sensory settings. Um, right now, we have a grant uh, funded by USDA NIFA. Um, the Youth Obesity Undergraduate Research and Ascension Fellowship Program. And what that does, it provides undergraduate students who have an interest in obesity-related research, um, as well as an interest in learning about ascension, an opportunity to, partic to participate in a summer research project. And that summer research project, what they do, they, they take my sensory course, I teach it to them over the summer, um, and then they conduct sensory evaluation out in the field. Um, this cohort of your fellows, what they did, they utilized the Georgia 4-H recipe book, which again is over a decade long. We don't know if kids like this or if, if, they, if they eat it. Um, and what they did, they utilized one of the recipes in there. It was a Southern salsa recipe um, and, and they made modifications to that Southern salsa recipe to see, you know, do students, I mean, do, do adolescents like both recipes? Do they not like both recipes? What do they like? Because you're providing these children of all these cookbooks that you just don't know if they like them. And, and that, that um, to me, that's, that's, that's not right. That's not right. Another study that um, we're working on and, and is difficult with the pandemic, we had, we've had to do some revamping for this study, acceptability of a Southern DASH diet among heart failure patients. Um, and the DASH diet, um, dietary approaches to stop hypertension um, has been around for years. Um, what we've been looking at is a, a Southern version of that. Uh, and how does it fare well with individuals who have um, heart issues, congestive heart failure, okay? Because that's the group who needs to be consuming these types of meals. And so when this study kind of started taking shape, um, I remember my colleagues said, oh, well, you know, can we use the sensory boost in the sensory lab? Um, and I looked at her, I said, well, how are you gonna get these people with congestive heart failure to the campus in Athens when it's difficult enough for them to go to the doctor as it is? And again, I keep telling people, you have to go to where the people are. Um, and so we're working with um, Athens Piedmont Healthcare. They have a wonderful um, kitchen facility um, to develop, design these meals and to then test them out among these individuals who have congestive heart failure, 
who that's the type of, of meals and food they need to be eating. But again, if they don't like it, what is it about the meal that they don't like? So we can make altercations because if we're truly trying to improve these, these health habits for, for individuals, we have to get the data from them. And, and as we all know with traditional um, sensory settings, especially in academia, I mean, you kind of know what that demographic is gonna be. It's gonna be mostly college students. You might grab some faculty, you might grab some staff, but again, sometimes you have to go to where, where the people are. So I wanna talk about some, some what are my confessions in, 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 in all of this? What have I learned? I mean, I want to sh share some of these confessions. Literacy levels in non-traditional settings. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm, I'm so embarrassed about it, actually, because I, you know, I've worked in the community setting as a registered dietitian, and so when we made the ballots for FDEP and SNAP Ed, um, I assumed that people would be able to comprehend them. Okay, and so um, I remember we had our our first sensory evaluation, um, and I I saw that someone was was staring, and I realized that there are some literacy levels. And so what did we do to negate that? Uh, we have program assistants, we have supervisors stand up there and, and go through the ballot. So they would show the ballot and read and, and point. So that way everyone could be on the same page. Um, and that's something that I did not foresee. Okay, I did not foresee the, the, the literacy um, point, point to that. Mutual suggestion among and outside of panelists. Um, and so, you know, in my course, I talk about, you know, um, psychological biases and sensory evaluation. And we talk about mutual suggestion among panelists. You know, if a panelist makes a face and the other panelist may say, oh, maybe this sample doesn't taste good because this panelist just made a face. But here I have mutual suggestion outside of panelists. So, and what does that mean? When working with Jackson County School District, um, what I did realize is that you have to have the food service team as well as the teachers, the educators on your side if you're trying to implement a new recipe into the school system because their opinion matters to those students, okay? And that's why I have mutual suggestion outside of panelists because the students are the panelists, but if the teacher has a frown on her face about sloppy joes that are made with lentils, then that's not gonna motivate the students to even wanna taste it, okay? And so, and so um, more training has to be done. We did a significant amount of training with food service staff, but we have to do training with teachers. We have to get them on our side as well. And I, I, I learned that, that um, and I'm an educator in the academic, you know, in the college university level, but for middle schools, uh, we, we, we have to get those teachers on our side. And sample size versus sample portion. I mean, we, we try to, um, you know, with F and Snap Bear, we try to make these recipes, you know, as appealing as, as they could be. Um, but a sample size looks different than a, a, an actual serving portion. Um, and that's something that we, we probably need to look at. Um, it, it would cost more, more money. It's, it's cheaper to give um, a sample size versus a full portion, but, um, people eat full portions, okay? So if you give a sample of something, um, people may like it, they may not like it, but if you would give them the actual serving, they can see, okay, this is how much I'm supposed to eat, um, you know, what, what is it about this that appeals to me or does not appeal to me. Future directions um, in terms of, of this research. Um, right now, I have a PhD student, we're working on a, a method for sensory evaluation for nutrition education programs. This research has been done in the state of Georgia, but to my knowledge, in terms of um, programs such as FNEP and SNAP-Ed that are across the United States, um, sensory evaluation methods has not been conducted um, because usually sensory scientists work in a traditional sensory setting. They're not going outside that setting and so, I would love to travel across the entire United States and conduct millions of sensory settings, but I'm not gonna be able to. But can we create some kind of method 
that other SNAP ed and FNAP programs could, could use as a basis and justification for them to conduct sensory evaluation because they're all need, in need of sensory evaluations, not just the state of Georgia. Um, this is needed um, throughout the country. So we're, we're working on, on this, this, this method. Exploration of hedonic scales. Um, you know, for these studies, we, we start off with effective testing, um, you know, utilizing that modified nine point hedonic scale. Um, but is it the, the best way to go about it? You know, with, with adolescents, um, you know, are they more receptive to a scale with emojis, um, a, a scale that highlights racial differences? Um, I'm not convinced that the scale that we're using is necessary, maybe the, the best scale. I think we need to explore some variations of these scales for these targeted groups. And advanced sensory testing methods. Um, is there room for advanced sensory testing methods? Absolutely. I, I really think that we could do some R index um, testing for to look at sweetness and and um, saltiness thresholds, you know, especially since that's an issue among those communities. We could definitely do something like that. I don't know about something like descriptive analysis. I don't know if that's warranted or needed, but I clearly see a need um, for something like our index because we need to see, you know, at what point um, can they detect the difference in, in certain thresholds for saltiness and sweetness uh, for these recipes. So. Um, definitely a, um, a, an avenue, a pipeline for, for not just um, hedonic testing. Before I wrap up, I have a picture of my newly renovated lab. I have a newly renovated um, sensory evaluation and product development lab here in, in Athens, Georgia. Um, and that wrapped up right just before the pandemic. So I was grateful for that as well. And I have a picture of this because I go back to what I, what I said earlier. I'm a classically trained sensory scientist. I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of the training that I had at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, under the advisement of Dr. Sue Lee. Those are my roots. Those will always be my roots. But it's from those roots that I'm able to look beyond the booth setting. Having said that, does that mean that I'm not doing sensory testing in, in, in a traditional setting? I'm absolutely doing it because I'm a classically trained sensory scientist. And so I have some, some studies, you know, now that my lab is renovated and I can get back in there, um, I'm definitely planning on some traditional um, sensory studies and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but it's, it's been wonderful to look outside the booth setting and to capture um, people who, who would be difficult or almost impossible to, to, to get in there. Um, but now that my lab is renovated, I'm, I'm going back into the booth, going back into the booth. I just wanna highlight some of the wonderful collaborations that I've had um, with, the, with the FNEP team, um, Carla Moore, who, who started off on the project, she's now with CDC, and Sarah Hennis is now the FNEP coordinator, Tiffany Williams is the, um, um, FNEP, um, she, um, she's uh, head of the, the program assistants and supervisors, um, because that's a, a study that, you know, you, it's not a one man or one woman show. Um, again, the SNAP Ed team, Dr. John Sung Lee, who coordinates that, um, Laurel Sanville, Ada, Cato Rivera, Jackie Dallas, Amanda Pinsack, and Brianna Williams, um, especially with that SNAP Ed study, um, we were in the Atlanta metro area, uh, really, um, you know, getting that study done. It was a, a grassroots e effort. Um, Deborah Morris from the Jackson County School District. Um, what a wonderful person because it's hard to get, you know, get into a school district to conduct um, any type of, of research. Um, and she's been um, so gracious. She wants to implement new new meals, um, but she's also aware that, you know, they have to meet certain guidelines um, and we have to see about acceptability of, of, of some of these, these meals. Um, I have two wonderful students, um, Allie Linky and, and, and Melanie Ng, um, who um, have been essential in terms of conquering their research. 
Um, Allie will be finishing up actually May of 2021. Um, my other PhD student, Melanie Ng, is actually um, doing a, a sensory evaluation internship with PepsiCo this upcoming summer. Um, and I'm so, so proud of her. Um, and I have a wonderful um, group of undergraduate research assistants. So um, it's, it's been some great collaborations. I look for more, more wonderful collaborations. Last slide. Um, thank you so much to, to everyone who's here. Uh, this is December. We're all experts with Zoom, but I know a lot of us are Zoomed out. And so I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say. And I hope it's been um, interesting and hopefully useful to you. Uh, my email address is right there, Go Cox. I did that on purpose. That's my personal cheerleader, Go Cox at uga.edu. Um, I'm, I'm done. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jen, for that great talk. Um, I was fully engaged, even though I'm up to here with Zoom fatigue most days. Um, I'm going to snag the first question, and then I would encourage anyone else who has questions for Dr. Cox to either unmute yourself and ask, uh, or you can put them in the chat, and I'll be monitoring that. Um, but Jen, I, I love this work. I love that you're doing this work. It seems so important to me that you're going to the people whose opinions matter on these questions. Um, and so, you know, it's super interesting that you're, you're getting the opinions of the people who are being taught these recipes. Uh, and I know you're asking, you know, what's your intent to, you know, prepare these in your own home. I'm wondering if you've done any follow-up yet on whether people actually follow through. Are people like going home and they're going to the grocery store and they're picking up these ingredients? Uh, and if they're making them at home, do they like them at home the same way that they like them you know, in that community setting where they're getting more coaching on the preparation? That is a great question, Emily. We have not followed up yet, yet. And, and that has been a, a discussion. You know, these, these studies, they're, they're, they're large scale and we're, we're, you know, we're trying, we got the baseline data from FNAP um, for the recipes that have been in existence for over 10 years. Um, now we have some information about some potential recipes that could be incorporated into nutrition education program with SNAP Ed, and just incorporating a new recipe into these nutrition education programming um, classes. I mean, we're talking about a year or two. It, 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's a minute. Part of it is because of the, the fiscal financing. It's always a year in advance. I'm still learning about it. I don't quite quite understand it because I just want to get stuff done. Uh, but we have asked, okay, you know, we're asking about preparation intent, uh, but we do need to go back and say, hey, have you prepared this recipe in the last month, in the last three months, in the last six months? When you prepared it, um, are these ingredients that you use or did you do some substitutions? What substitutions did you do? You know, so we, we have to go back to that. With the um, with the the recipes that have been in existence for over ten years, right now we're getting some information from the program assistants who teach the recipes. So we need to get their insights as well. So we we've done a focus group with the program assistants, and then with the new recipes, we're doing a study where they make the recipes and then they conduct sensory evaluation because if they don't like the new recipes, how are they going to even be able to demonstrate these newly developed recipes to the participants? So, um, but, it, and those two, actually those two studies are, are right now ongoing. Um, with the pandemic, uh, I don't know when we're gonna get back into face-to-face -face with the community. I'm, I'm figuring it's gonna be sometime fall 2021. Okay, and so that's when maybe we could start um, following up. They do a lot of, of virtual things, but um, you know, sensory testing is, is, is hands on. E even if you're asking about um, something like preparation, where okay, you don't have to have a sample or a food product, uh, you still need that that face to face. I I, I even tell my my students because I've been teaching you know virtually as many other professors have there's only so much that zoom can do and i'm i'm, I'm ready to, to see people face to face 
I hope that answers your question, Emily. Absolutely. And there's a lot of questions popping up in the chat. Uh, so the first from Alex Feldmeyer, um, she asks, were demographics a uh, differentiating factor in recipe or food liking? Great question, Alex. I hope you're well. Um, I, I was Alex's um, TA. So thank you for taking the time to, to listen to me, Alex. I appreciate it. Great question because with, with, SNAP, with the SNAP Ed study, and that was collected two months, seven newly developed recipes. We tried to diversify the, the participants, but during those two months, um, the majority of participants were, I think it was 50 to 65. So you're talking about a different demographic as opposed to someone in their 20s or 30s or 40s. And that makes a difference. Um, you may think that, oh, this is just a recipe but with the banana pudding overnight oats. Uh, the Snap Ed team, they were fighting for that recipe. I was telling them to get rid of it. But I did think about it. I said, well, the demographic you served it to, you know, if you're 50 or 60, you may not want a banana pudding overnight Oh, You know, it, 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 it does, age comes into play with that. So, you know, um, with those newly developed recipes, do we need to broaden the demographics since these recipes could go into nutrition education programming throughout the state of Georgia? We do. Um, for that two month study, we had quite a few of older um, participants and we do need to investigate more into meeting all the demographics for um, both snap Ed and FNAP. Good question, Alex. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question in the chat comes from Tanya Edition. Um, so she thanked you for your interesting talk and your perspective um, and was curious about your comment on literacy. It made her wonder what other assumptions we make about our subjects. Um, she says plant-based food is very trendy at the moment uh, and were your subjects aware of the trend or interested in it or maybe resistant to it? Great question. So for the Jackson County um, School District project, and we still have that data. And remember, it's, it's 1,500 students. So we're, we're in the process of analyzing um, that data. We initially did not want students to know that the entrees were plant-based, OK? And we had hoped to look at the impact of telling them or advertising, OK? Um, and that's something we were talking about doing in the pandemic hit. And so we can only, you know, do the, the, the acceptability portion um, of the study. Um, I believe it, it does make a difference. Um, Plant-based, I agree, it, 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 is, it is trendy, um, but I, I think this is gonna be a longer lasting trend. I, um, and I'm not a fan of trends, but I think plant-based is gonna, it's gonna be around. It's gonna be a longer lasting trend. Um, would students be more acceptable of a plant-based school entree if they knew it was plant-based? I don't know. I, I can't tell you that's something we need to look into. But what I do know is that, again, you have to have the adults on your side. You have to have those teachers sitting there eating the sloppy joe that's lentil-based or the, the, the sweet potato chili fries. You have to have the food service staff. Uh, which some people may think they're not important. They're probably the mo one of the most important in, the, in this equation. They're serving it to the students. Those students have connections with them. So it's the, it's the knowledge and advertising component that we need to look into, but also increased training of food service staff and collaborations with, with teachers as well. That's great. Uh, the chat's blowing up. So the next question comes from David Bloom. Uh, he wonders how we can be better uh, about bringing initiatives like diversity, equity, and conclusion, inclusion um, that feel like they have more focus and energy behind them to our work as sensory scientists. Uh, where do we need to start and what would have the most impact? That's a great, good. To, thank you, David Bloom, for attending this presentation. That's a great question. And I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like, I don't know. In a, in a traditional sensory evaluation setting, I really don't know because the demographics are, you know, if you're talking about academic setting, it's the college students, um, it's faculty, it's staff. Now you could try to, um, and we, you know, if you're looking for a certain demographic, you could try to make it balanced within college students or um, faculty or staff. But you know, you you get who wants to participate or who's 
able to participate. And, and that's kind of what drew me towards looking outside of the sensory booth setting, because you do get more of that diversity and inclusion. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to get it inside the, the sensory booth setting, unless you, you know, when you're um, preliminary, pre pre preliminarily trying to get people in the booth testing setting, if you could get some demographic information from them and then make some choices from there. Um, that, that is just, it's just hard to do um, in an academic setting as, as David, as you, as you well know, and that's something that, um, but even though it's hard, it's something that we still need to think about. It doesn't mean that, oh, it's hard, for, forget it, we're not gonna do it. That's something we, we need to think about, ac academic settings as well as um, sensory companies. That's great. Uh, Linda Flammer asks if you've examined the predictive value of rating appearance, flavor, and texture on liking ratings. Um, she says you have a lot of data, you could speed up your testing if you could you know, maybe eliminate based on those features. We, we did not, you know, we just want to get, this had never been done before. And so we just, and that's why I call it baseline data because I feel like we can go so many places with this. I mean, they, we've never done sensory evaluation of anything in terms of federal nutrition education programming. So um, that's why we started the way that we did. Um, in terms of speed and things up, we need to, because I'm, I, you know, I'm even beginning to realize, okay, this is going to take a year. This is going to take another year. So um, that's something that we, we definitely need to look into. Yeah, it's an interesting question. They say you, you with your eyes first, right? If how much of it by making the food more appealing to look at, could you kind of maybe get over some of that squeamishness about trying new food? Um, Harry Lawless says, I have a war story about testing military field rations in the high Sierras in winter which is just an extremely intriguing comment. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I'll make it brief. Um, <laughs> I, I love the talk because it reminded me of some of the things that I've tried over the years. Uh, when I was on my postdoc at the Army Natick Labs, um, we were developing a ration called a, a long range patrol ration um, or LERP. It was before the MRE and uh, uh, Two of my friends who are army captains and also psych PhDs were sent out to the high Sierras in the middle of winter uh, to follow some Marines around in mountain warfare training and administer questionnaires about the long range patrol ration. Uh, the study wasn't entirely successful because they had to mainly consider um, freezing to death. Uh, so we learned a lot about uh, the limitations of uh, testing in the field from that. And my takeaway was to develop a laboratory. Uh, the last lab session at Cornell every year was to send the students out into the woods in the snow and have them uh, prepare MREs, meals ready to eat, uh, uh, military field rations, and then develop a questionnaire and a procedure for uh, doing that in sub-zero temperatures. Oh, no, I, I appreciate it, Dr. Laws, and thank you so much for attending this presentation. And you know, I mean, that makes me think about my sensory course um, right now, which is jam packed. And, and you know what? My sensory course does not even touch about, you know, doing something outside of the sensory booth setting because I just don't have the, the time. Everything is about in the booth setting, all the different tests. And what I've talked about here, I don't touch on any of that in that course. And what you just said is making me think about how can I do some kind of small activity with them just so they can get a glimpse into, oh, you can do this outside the, the, the booth setting. Um, and I, I started teaching that course three years ago. Um, and, and so now I'm thinking like, oh, you know, I, I need to, cause they don't, they don't know that I'm looking outside the, the booth setting because they, they see me in the lab. My students see me in the lab. They don't see me outside the lab. So that's something to think about. Yeah, and uh, uh, it made a lot of students think about, um, they never considered um, foods for special populations, uh, including military rations um, or people that have certain nutritional requirements. Uh, and so that was a wake up call for them to think, well, I may have a career um, with the Department of Defense, <laughs> who knows? Absolutely, no, that's something for me to think about. Thank you so much.
Um, so I'll just acknowledge that it's two now, but there, there's still a lot of questions. So I guess, uh, you know, I invite anyone who is interested in, in staying on a little longer to spend a few more minutes uh, with Jin, um, kind of wrapping up these questions in the chat. Um, the next comes from Joey Donovan, who says, fantastic talk. Um, he absolutely loves your approach to get to the end consumer and how it took you to a non-traditional setting. Uh, fast forward to now in these unprecedented times, uh, I think we're all finding ourselves in these non-traditional sensory test settings, uh, which is very true. Uh, so what were some best practices that you explored to make your testing in non-traditional settings successful? Uh, first of all, thank you, Joey. Thank you for, for um, taking the time to, to be here. Um, for, for me, I realize it's the training. Um, because you can't do it by yourself. So you have to train other individuals who are conducting sensory evaluation and sensory testing. And so in this presentation, I briefly highlighted some of the forms that were created, um, briefly touched on the many in-person and virtual trainings provided to FNEP program assistants, FNEP staff. Um, briefly touched on the, the trainings for, for food service um, because they are the ones conducting it. That's why we're looking into um, some kind of a, a method, some kind of method or training document that could be utilized by others. You know, instead of um, repeating these steps, uh, we are trying to figure out what are these common best practices that we could show to other federally funded nutrition education programs, uh, maybe other school districts. So they could have some sort of guide um, as, you know, we've just been starting starting from scratch, um, but you don't wanna keep starting from scratch. You wanna, you wanna build the house. And so we're, we're, ju we're just, we're working on the foundation right now. Thank you, Joey. And I, I love this next question from Wan Yuan Kuo. Uh, she says that she loved your insight about, about going out uh, from the booth into the communities. Um, and within the programs that you work with, have you seen any efforts or interest in sensory education or teaching students to taste and recognize the taste or sensory properties of various fruits, veggies, or healthy ingredients to encourage diversified diets? First of all, thank you, Wang Yuan, for, for your question. Thank you for um for, for coming to this, this presentation. Um, in terms of the community setting, I, I, I'm gonna say no right now because it's so new to them. Conducting sensory evaluation, for, for, for someone to ask them their opinion is so new. You know, and I think we as experts, people ask us for our opinion all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you wish people didn't ask you for your opinion. But for them, it's so fresh and, and, and new for them to be able you know, we're saying we want your insights. We want you to try this and we want you to rate and give us your honest opinion. And your opinion matters, your feedback matters. And so again, we're, we're just starting from, from baseline. Um, I, I hope in time, especially, you know, I highlighted that um, your grant that I'm, I'm working on and I'm hoping a component of that, especially for adolescents with 4-H, um, cause Georgia has a large 4-H um, program. I'm hoping we can do some kind of incorporation of um, sensory um, evaluation or getting them exposure to, to tasting and, and, and trying different projects, um, particularly with, with that grant. Um, for the FNAP and, and SNAP Ed, um, it's just so raw and refreshing that um, people want their, their, their insights. I'm gonna, um, I'm trying to be brief, but one of the, 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 the testing areas that we did for, um, that was done for um, SNAP Ed was um, a, a, a place that provided transient housing. So we're dealing with all the mental health issues from someone who's, who's a transient who has temporary housing, uh, but we also still want them to improve their eating behaviors for, you know, for their health. And so we're trying to get their inputs and insights. So it's, it's a long journey, I think, we, we, we have with this. Um, but we have to try. and We have to start somewhere, and that's what I'm trying to do. 
Great. Thanks for that, Jen. Um, there's one last question in the chat from Jeffrey Scott. Um, he says, going out into the communities during COVID-19, I imagine, can be a bit of a challenge and asks, uh, how have you adjusted to that? Thank you, Jeffrey. I've adjusted because I haven't been out in the community. That's how I've adjusted. So, so with these, these studies and everything, um, like I said, the, the, the project with Jackson County, we wrapped up right before the pandemic. I wanted to look at advertising in terms of that study, but 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 did not because we couldn't get back into the schools. Um, and during this time, I mean, right now, um, I'm analyzing data, I'm, I'm, I'm working on manuscripts and I'm publishing, which is great for a tenured track faculty member, as we, as we all know. Um, but looking in, into the future, I, I, I have been thinking about, you know, are, are we ever gonna be out in the field like we used to? Are things ever going to be the same? And right now, I think we all, we're all like, we, we, don't, we don't know. Um, is that going to involve um, wearing a face mask and doing sensory evaluation? Is that going to mean um, less people per, per session? How is that going to look? Um, and I, I think about it often, I, I, and I haven't answered it because I, you know, I've been working on um, um, you know, manuscripts and analyzing um, data, but um, I love working in the community. I don't um, want to never work in the community because of the pandemic, but I'm hoping, as we all are, I'm hoping that 2021 will bring us um, better clarification, better answers into how to move forward with the community. And my colleagues who work in the community um, are also, you know, obviously experiencing those challenges. All right. Uh, are there any other questions, I guess, live? <laughs> I, I just had a quick question. Hi, Jen. It's Amber Elhada. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, uh, we did a swap. I gave a seminar at University yes, of Virginia. <laughs> and it was outstanding. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the last question. Um, I think there, like, like you already said, there'd be a lot of issues with doing some of this testing over Zoom, and maybe there'd be accessibility issues. But could there be kind of an advantage of being able to reach a broader community or maybe um, even like geographically wider? Um, have you thought about that at all? No, Amber, you're absolutely right. I mean, even like I said, even with, with Zoom, I was looking forward to, to coming to, to Philly and, 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 and visiting and Monell and, and then, oh, okay, it's over, over Zoom. Um, but the, the advantage of Zoom is that you can reach more people. Exactly. And so, does Zoom offer a space where maybe we could do some kind of more national type of sensory evaluation with limited resource consumers? It does. Mm -hmm. It does. Um, and that's something to, to think about, you know, in terms of what this new normal is going to look like. I think right now, like I said, it's December, everybody Zoomed out, but Zoom has brought us so many advantages. Yeah. And it's, been, it's allowed us to even come together more than we ever have. And so we don't want to lose sight of that. And so um, I think it could be a space for focus groups, for national focus groups for certain demographics who, again, are fearful of coming to a traditional sensory setting or who don't, you know, don't want to do that. So yeah, that's a good uh, point. Yeah. yeah. So, so no, I, I, I'm thinking about, you know, let's not let go of, of Zoom, maybe, maybe for a week during the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, are there any other questions for Jen? Yes, uh, this is Gary Beecham. I have a question that, that I would like to ask her. I'd like to take her back to her earlier days of studying salt. And um, the fact is that uh, there is a huge program uh, headed by FDA and CDC to reduce salt in the environment uh, by uh, making uh, or recommending that companies reduce sodium gradually in their foods. Uh, and the idea is based on sensory work, uh, some of which was done in Monel, uh, suggesting that when people go on lowered sodium diets, they gradually reduce their preference for uh, uh, saltier foods. And the, so the theory is, and which is in the, in the federal uh, re uh, recommendations now, is that if this was done on a population-wide basis, we could shift everybody's sensory perception and liking for salt or salty foods uh, down and uh, they wouldn't even know it and uh, uh, we would be much more healthy. Uh, this seems like one of the biggest experiments ever done without any real uh, attempt 
to measure whether in fact this is happening. And my question to you is, do you know of anybody or are you interested in trying to see whether in fact, as the sodium is reduced in, uh, in manufactured foods, which presumably it is being done uh, gradually, uh, whether there is a, a population-wide uh, change in, in salt taste perception and preference, um, which would require doing something like you're doing in terms of, of measuring real people out in the real world as in their response to salt. First of all, thank you much for so much for attending. Um, I, I was I had an opportunity to meet you um, some years ago when you came to to um, speak at at, at Illinois, um, and you, you're definitely um, taking me you're taking me back. But 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 um, I feel like I never lost sight of you know my dissertation research. Um, and one of the reasons why I did that dissertation research on sodium reduction and processed foods, and particularly um, looking at people who have hypertension. Um, who are overweight or obese is because, you know, as African-American female, um, I, you know, I, I, I battle with certain health conditions such as um, obesity, overweight, um, hypertension, um, um, and, and, and other um, illnesses in, 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 in my family. Um, and again, the community study is so exciting. And, and I, I've looked on CDC several times about those sodium reduction grants um and i haven't seen one out yet i'm i'm, I'm waiting because I, I i i want to apply and get involved in that um and maybe we could utilize you know fnep or snap ed populations and that's why i i was talking about um and it would be maybe a policy study some kind of r index testing method to determine what threshold do these participants notice a change in saltiness or, or sweetness. Um, I remember when um, the, the Institute of Medicine, you know, they were talking about one of the strategies for sodium reduction in processed foods would be a stealth, stealth method where, you know, X amount is slowly decreased to where people don't, don't know it and it's not advertised. Um, and so I definitely think that these populations could be utilized for, for something like that. Um, and I keep, I, I know CDC had a sodium reduction in communities um, grant. It's closed now and, and I, I keep waiting for it to open. Um, but I, I'm, yes, bottom line is, yes, I'm looking into those, those kinds of opportunities. Mm, I do have uh, another question or more a comment, uh, especially regarding your, you know, the final confession, how much people has to be on board with schools and so on. My question is, in the moment you actually, you know, tested it out and want to implement like more uh, pl uh, plant-based food at school, do you think or do you expect that even parents will actually go against you or will come and say, why, why are you not giving them meat? You're going to give them beans or whatsoever. And how much in that moment is working actually on the entire community, including the parents, is probably has to be, you know, done in advance to implement those, those changes? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think parents do need to be involved. I think, again, it's got to start with food service and, and teachers. Um, and from that study, you know, we created the recipes um, from, from, from scratch because um, part of it was to have, um, you know, we didn't want... Um, there are certain companies who deal with, with, with plant-based, but we wanted the food service staff to have actual lentils and to boil those lentils and to pulse them. And then to add, cause you can actually buy um, like a lentil, you know, sloppy joe already, already made. Um, now with that study, we paired the plant-based entree with a, a regular entree me menu um, to where the students will have a choice. And so, if there are school districts who are trying to implement more plant-based meals, you still need to, you know, offer something that's that's meat-based. Um, in terms of getting parents on your side, that again is a process. It will probably be in a form of, of pamphlets or, or, or flyers, but you have to have the food service staff and then you have to have the teachers because those are who the students are directly interacting with during the lunch, the mm -hmm. lunch period. Now, in terms of a parent not wanting their child to eat something plant-based, um, of course, that would be the parent's decision. And the school districts will still offer um, other menu, other menu options. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. And Jen, you have one more question in the chat. You're like maybe the most popular <laughs> speaker of all time. That's fine. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. <laughs> All right, so Annika Schenkel um, thanked you for taking the time to speak with us. Um, she's a recent graduate of Colorado State University's food science program um, and loved her sensory course. Uh, so she's potentially interested in pursuing a career in this field. Uh, do you have any recommendations for young people to get into sensory evaluation? Um, she asked, are graduate degrees and further education necessary to find careers? Oh my goodness, I'm gonna try to be short because <laughs> I can talk about this all day long. Um, you have an amazing um, career trajectory. I mean, right now, to my knowledge and what I'm being told, there's a shortage of sensory sciences. There, there aren't a whole lot of us out there, which is why for the work I'm doing, I'm trying to create some kind of um, method, you know, to share um, because I can't do it by, by, by myself. Um, you know, all companies are looking for, you know, some kind of a, a sensory scientist. Um, and, and it could be a food company or any kind of consumer good. I'll never forget when I was talking to somebody who worked for Procter & Gamble who did sensory testing. So it doesn't just have to be food, te uh, food based, but you're in a, um, a, a wonderful career in terms of graduate school. Um, that is entirely up to you. I, I know people who work in, um, you know, the sensory field who have bachelor's. Um, some people have masters, some people have um, a PhD. Um, if you're just graduating, there's nothing wrong with um, working for a food company as an um, entry level, maybe sensory technician, getting some exposure, um, and then going from there. Um, a lot of my students at UGA, because again, I just started teaching the sensory evaluation course in fall of 20. 18 and UGA did not have a sensory evaluation course and so I'm so proud that I was able to bring that. Um, I'm in the Department of Foods and Nutrition. We have a Department of Food Science and Technology and so that course is cross-listed because the Department of Food Science and Technology houses the food science students. Um, so that course is cross-listed uh, but uh, not everyone knows about sensory evaluation or what sensory science is. Um, and so when I teach my course each semester, it's a new experience for students. They've never heard of it. They don't know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I think they think, I, you know, I've made it up. But by the end of the semester, after I've um, taught them, and then we do site visits to uh, market research firms in the Atlanta area, they realize, oh, this is, you know, Dr. Kaz isn't making this up. And this is actually very interesting. And this is something that I could pursue a career in. So I love to see their faces when they first meet me in August. And then when they, when, you know, when they finish the course in, in December, because that, you know, they, they, they've acquired an entirely new skill set that they, that they've never had. And that goes for both the food science students, as well as the um, food and, and, and nutrition students. So it's a course that I'm so glad that I'm able to teach because then I, you know, I can share my nutrition knowledge, my food science, sensory, everything. Um, and I, and I see the, the change and transformation in them. And so what I have to say to you is welcome to the world of sensory science and sensory evaluation. Um, you're now part of a wonderful community, um, a passionate community, an energetic community. Um, and, and all we want to do is, is, is make food products better, make recipes better. And so um, you will fare very well um, in this area. Oh, she thanks you for your insight. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Cox, for, for coming and speaking with us today, uh, sharing your perspective.